and really to open it up for questions so that I can talk about whatever interests you all. So I hope to not talk for very long, <laughs> um, but I'll give you a bit of a spiel about civil eats and and also extend it a little bit to talk about kind of this moment in food and farming because as all of you know, we're in a really interesting and I think really pivotal, pivotal moment. Um, so let's see, I could do some screen sharing. First, maybe I'll just say civil eats if anyone um, is unfamiliar with it is a uh, we're an independent news and commentary website focused specifically on the food system. And for us at this point, that means kind of two sides of the coin. So the production side, we focus a lot on farmers and the challenges they face and kind of the, just their experiences and the landscape that they're working in. And then we also focus on consumer, the consumer side of the puzzle. And I know you guys, this audience is, working on both sides of that because you're all growing your own food and thinking about how food is grown. So so in some ways you're a perfect audience <laughs> for Civil Eats. Um, and I just want to put in a plug that we're in a moment right now where because of the pandemic, you can subscribe to the site for whatever you want to pay. So if you hit a paywall while we're talking about this or after we talk about this, I'm probably not supposed to say this, but you could subscribe for a dollar and it would last you a year and you could read all of our stories. <laughs> I would rather reach more people at this point um, than anything else. So we'd love to have you. Um, you can always subscribe to our newsletter as well and just see, kind of peek at what we're doing without even subscribing to the site itself. Okay, so um, I'll start by sharing my screen and sharing the site. Having a weird thing where it's not quite working right. I'm sorry. Let me try again. We just tested this and it worked great. There we go. So this is Civil Eats, and it's we're actually going to uh, launch a brand new version of our site in about a week. So this is kind of, this is a site we've had for a few years and it's not gonna change radically, but we've been working on a redesign for about six months that we're excited to debut. Um, it, we really cover the gamut, like I was saying, on both sides of the, the coin. So everything from um, policy issues and um, questions around, you know, here we have a story about, is it possible to grow enough local food to feed the country regionally. Um, here we have a story that we just ran that I think was really important about um, the USDA Farm Box program, which is a, a really interesting effort by the uh, Department of Food and Ag to connect growers to consumers during a time um, when both populations have been kind of struggling and they, um, they unfortunately worked with this amazing group called the so uh, Federation of Southern Cooperatives in the South for the first six months of the pandemic and then dropped them. Uh, so we did a story about that and it's gotten a lot of attention this week. Um, I'm just gonna run through kind of what's on our, our front page if you're curious. Uh, we, do, we do a book guide every year. Um, we, we've been covering uh, indigenous communities a lot in the last year. It's become a big focus of ours, talking about indigenous foodways and some of the challenges that folks in indigenous communities face. Um, we've also added video recently. Um, we've done a series of video profiles. This one is of a, a group in the Cape Valley producing olive oil, Seca Hills. You, some of you may have heard of it. Um, this is a story that I worked on about turkey and regenerative agriculture, which I can talk about in a bit. Um, and this is a story about uh, a group that's just recently formed to, um, to kind of unite a number of farming elements to talk about the climate. So this is our front page currently. Let's see, I was gonna 
run through some kind of general thoughts about the moment. Um, so this moment for farmers, I got asked by one of the board members to talk a little bit about kind of the, the huge transition that is coming. And some of you may have been already aware of this, but the average age of the American farmer is right around 60. I think it's like 59 at this point. And so that means that uh, a lot of folks are retiring which is great for them <laughs> if they can do it. But it also means that, um, you know, they need to get the most for their land that they can because in many cases that land is their only form of retirement income or, you know, their main form of retirement income. And so those folks are going to take advantage of the, the high prices of land. And that means that a lot of young wannabe farmers or wannabe farm owners are having an incredibly hard time taking their place. And as a result, there's a huge kind of wave of consolidation. We've already seen a lot of consolidation on farms in the US, but there's a, a potentially a really large wave of consolidation and bank ownership. And, um, you know, we're already in a moment where I think small independent, small scale independent farmers, the farmers themselves are not small. I always have to remember to say that. Um, small scale farmers are struggling and they are very often working off the farm to, to make a go of it. Uh, it's I think over half of farmers in the US have to have some kind of off farm income. A lot of the time that means for insurance coverage, but a lot of the time it also means just to be able to pay their bills and to be able to essentially subsidize the farming that they're doing. So um, we've been covering this for a while, this ongoing issue, we cover the, um, just the way that that's young farmers struggle and, the, and the, some of the innovative things that have been happening to try to get um, to try to support them more. I, I wanted to share this one example. This is a story we just ran a few months back. Um, there's a, there are a few states that are trying to incentivize landowners to sell their land and other assets to young and beginning farmers. And we thought that was worth covering. Um, so that's one example of kind of an innovative, innovative approach, but there are others. Um, young farmers are up against a lot of challenges, as I'm sure a lot of you know, whether they're urban farmers or trying to farm in rural areas. Um, I don't envy people taking on farming as an occupation or trying to at this moment. Um, what else? Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I can see my notes. Um, so and, and one piece of the puzzle that I've been really focused on is the rise of technology um, and really looking at how we're replacing people on the farm landscape. And it's been happening for a really long time, but um, I think it's hard as, as urban people um, to really conceptualize like what that looks like. Some of you may be from rural areas or maybe you know, may have families still in rural areas, but I've been trying to spend some time over the last four or five years going to the middle of the country to really understand it for myself. Because for a long time, I wrote about food and ag, mostly from this kind of consumer perspective. Even though I was raised on a small organic farm, I really had no idea what it was like to raise corn and soy on say like a thousand acres. That was, that was really foreign to me. So I decided to start going to some of these places and just talking to people and trying to understand it better. And one of the things that became super clear to me is that, um, you know, that technology is replacing people and that there are, you know, you can buy a half million dollar combine and you don't need to pay anyone else to farm those thousand acres anymore. You can do it as one guy. And that's really changed the culture in a lot of places. And in my opinion, it's it's a real loss. You know, it's a loss of communities. It's a loss of um, people whose hands are in the dirt, like you all experience. Um, it's a loss of people who are like actually connected with the natural world. Um, so I've been looking at technology. I ran a story. I wrote a story. Let's see. I don't know if I have it queued up. Um, I don't think I do. I wrote a story this fall that I could try to remember to, or let's see, should I bring it up? Mm. All right, I'll just bring it up. Um, it was about 
the ways that we're replacing workers in the Central Valley here in California. And this is a, an interesting topic to me because there's a lot of hype around ag tech and um, there's a whole world of, uh, you know, invention and it's really, it's a piece of the tech sector. It's treated as a piece of the tech sector. Um, there's a lot of money going into it and there's not a lot of conversation about that fact that we're replacing people and what is that going to look like? And there's, you know, that there's tech replacing people all over our world, right? Everything from the, um, the kiosks when you're crossing the Bay Bridge, right? They just got rid of the final people who were there recently um, to the people at the BART terminals to even people in restaurants are trying to replace a lot of them. So it's not new, but I, I'm really interested in the way that this is happening on farms. And I spend a lot of time talking to people really trying to find some people who were critical of it because there, there are so many voices out there that are like, yes, this is amazing. Let's get rid of this really hard work. And, and I think it's, it's obviously really complicated. And personally, I kind of came down on the side of believing that, um, that we need better jobs. We don't need to get rid of all the jobs, but we do need much better jobs. And that's kind of a, a stance we've had at Civil Eats for a long time. We've been looking at food and ag labor for years and we know that it's it's hugely problematic particularly on the farm worker level um, we've been covering farm workers for a long time um, sorry I hope I'm not rambling let's see where was I in my notes um, I'm still kind of running down this the this moment for farmers and I'm going to talk about consumers in a middle in a moment but uh, yeah we've been covering the pressures related to climate change quite a bit as well. So I wanted to mention that we've been covering the ways that farmers are dealing with um, everything from floods to droughts. As you all know, the droughts on this end, but um, we had a story about the derecho that hit Iowa this year um, and how it impacted farm communities, but it also in impacted some meatpacking workers. Um, we've, yeah, the as you probably know, climate is one of the biggest factors when it comes to thinking about how food and agriculture and farming are gonna change in the next couple of years. And there's a big push to farm regeneratively, which um, is a little different than organic production, but there's some overlap, but there's a lot of people are talking about regenerative because it's, it's a little bit of a different frame, right? Organic is mostly about what you're leaving out. It's about leaving out synthetic pesticides and um, fertilizers. And to do that, you have to build soil. And so I think there's a lot of potential for organic agriculture to be regenerative, but there's a really big movement right now to use that term regenerative. Folks may have heard about this. It's, <laughs> it's definitely the way that the food world is moving from the consumer end and, and also from the farm end, I believe. Um, so yeah, we've been covering regenerative agriculture a lot and the conversations around regenerative agriculture. Um, we've also really been covering the ways that, um, the ways that uh, consolidation <laughs> impacts is our food supply. And I thought I would just share this. This is a real, always a really popular chart. Um, and it, it also relates to technology, obviously, but a different part of it. Um, yeah, these are the, the remaining seed companies essentially, and it's kind of hard to see, but, uh, most of them are owned at this point by the big five, or maybe that it's now it's big four, the chemical companies, chemical and seed companies, as you guys probably know, have mostly merged and the, they're basically chemical companies, but they also sell seeds at this point. Um, so that's, that's impacting the, the farm landscape. Um, I also wanted to share this. Uh, wait, is this the one? No, this is the one, sorry. Um, this was a story we did earlier this year uh, related to some of the, the subsidy money that went to farmers. And as you might guess, most of it went to the really big farms. So we did a story just looking at uh, how smaller farms, smaller scale independent farms got the short shrift. Um, here's the story that we ran yesterday that I was mentioning. Um, as you may know, there's a lot of 
um, there is a, has been a, a history of discrimination against farmers of colors, farmers of color, black farmers and indigenous farmers within the USDA. And so uh, the fact that these farmers are no longer gonna be supported by the USDA this year and aren't gonna be able to get the produ produce that they started growing. And you know we're now ending the growing season, so it's less of a big deal. But in September when they got dropped, it was actually a really, I think, huge deal because communities that were getting this food stopped getting it and the farmers who had planted their crops had nothing, nowhere to sell them for the most part. So uh, yeah, that was another story I wanted to share. Let's see. Um, What else? Uh, I touched a little bit on farm workers. I wanted to share this one story about, um, we've done a, a fair amount of coverage of the way that, that farm workers are being impacted in the age of COVID. Um, it's pretty dark stuff. I actually saw some, there's some new research that's out this week, I think. Um, and the, yeah, the positivity rate is really high. Um, this was a piece that we did covering particularly workers who come here on H-2A visas. And one really interesting thing that happened this year was workers here on H-2A visas to farm actually went home. They decided it wasn't worth it, which to me was a big, a big statement about this moment that folks who have made the effort to come here, um, who often really, I don't know how much you all know about the H-2A program, but it's grown hugely since um, since the Trump administration took office, and there was a lot of irony in that because, you know, they said no one's going to come in. We're going to put this much bigger border up, but simultaneously they brought all these people in to work on farms uh, through the H two A program. The program increased, I think, two or three fold after the Trump administration took office. So a lot of people come over to work on farms and they got here and many of them said, no way, I'm not gonna do this because they were in isolated places. They weren't getting testing, they weren't getting treatment. So um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's a peek into some of our, our farm labor, recent farm labor coverage. Obviously coronavirus has made it into almost all of our coverage in the last nine months because that's what everybody's covering and it's hard to hard to figure out you know how many stories to run that don't touch on coronavirus directly for the first two or three months everything we ran was about coronavirus it was about getting food to people and about what the farmers were doing and about whether the markets were going to stay open um, and really i would say it took till about the middle of the summer that we felt confident in running anything else like we felt like anyone was going to be reading anything else um, and I understand. I mean, I was doing a lot of the same kind of just sort of scanning the headlines to try to get my bearings to understand, you know, what was happening with the virus. So um, I would say now we're at a point where it's sort of a given that everything we cover will somehow be interwoven with coronavirus, but we don't, we're not doing it as explicitly every single time, which is, um, you know, it's a mixed thing. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's, <laughs> it feels weird to be covering something like agriculture policy when we know this really huge pandemic is impacting so many people's lives. Um, so I was going to move on to the consumer side. Let's see. Um, and if I, if I'm rambling, if you guys want to ask questions, please let me know. I, <laughs> I feel like I'm, I, it's a little weird to be in a box talking to myself and not seeing other people. Um, Okay, so I mentioned con consolidation and consolidation has really impacted the experience for consumers as well as farmers. Um, we talked a bit about seed ownership, um, but as you know, our choices in the grocery store are greatly reduced because there are so few options for you know, for buying food from individual farms um, because the retailers control so much of the distribute, you know, work, they work with huge distributors, but ultimately they control so much of, of what we eat and how much it costs and what's available and what makes it on the shelf. Um, I could talk about labels a little bit. See, this is my problem. We cover so many different topics. So I think I'm gonna skip labels and see if, you, if any of you all wanna talk about labels, I'm happy to. Labels is like, 
a big topic for consumers, as you all know, and there's a lot of confusion about what labels mean. And we have written a fair amount about different labels over the last couple of years. Um, let's see. I want to uh, get let to me questions. know. Do you want to yeah. go to some questions? Um, I can. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Or would you rather? Yeah, do them I can do either. Air? I can okay. do either. I just started okay. to feel like I was talking for a while. So okay. So let me let me ask you some questions and then we sure. can go back to you great. talking. We've got some really good ones. Um, this one was online. This one came on to our website. Somebody actually, Laura actually emailed our website and said, "What can we do to support small farms and sustainable organic agriculture with humane treatment of animals?" in an era of factory farming and big ag dominance of our food supply? It's a good question, Laura. <laughs> um, it's kind of, I mean, for me, it's kind of the question. And um, I mean, there's the kind of obvious stuff you can do as a consumer. Uh, and I, I was saying to these folks the other day when we had a pre-meeting that I've kind of gotten to the point where I feel like, well, that stuff is important. You know, I, I belong to a CSA and I, um, I grow some of my own food. I feel like the, um, it's as important, if not more important to start to understand the systems at, at work and to uh, participate in, you know, in that piece of it as much as you can. Uh, there are a lot of really great advocacy groups, depending on what issues you care about. Um, you listed off animal welfare, you talked about organics, so you probably care about pesticides. Pesticide Action Network is great. Depending on where you come down on the animal issue, there are there's a huge range of different groups. I like Farm Forward because they're, they are trying to, um, you know, reform factory farms and they're doing it in kind of an inclusive way. Um, I think that that's the most important piece, but a lot of people disagree with me and they don't want to see any animals raised on farms. So, um, yeah, I, I was going to talk a little bit about um, the policy piece and I do feel like sort of getting informed about policy and, you know, who's making these decisions, whether it's on a state level or a federal level is a really important part of trying to change any of this, um, trying to understand the agriculture committees. You know, if you really want to get wonky, you could spend some time trying to understand the agriculture committees. We're at an interesting moment where we're going to have new members. Uh, we're also going to have a new ag secretary. And I don't know if any of you have been following that, but there's a kind of a, here I actually, I saved the New York Times article, which doesn't quite do the story justice, but if any of you, I don't know if you've read this piece about uh, Marsha Fudge. Um, she is the person that a lot of folks are hoping, a lot of folks I know in the kind of food advocacy world are really hoping gets um, chosen to be the agriculture secretary, sorry, uh, excuse me, agriculture secretary. Uh, there's also, there's a big faction of folks pushing for Heidi Heitkamp. And so there's a, within the food policy world, there's a, a lot of discussion right now about what those choices would meet, would mean. And uh, Marsha Fudge, for the reasons I was talking about earlier, related to the USDA and discrimination. And as we know, there's a lot of uh, racism in our food system. So choosing the first uh, African-American woman to be the head of the USDA would be in and of itself an amazing step. But beyond that, uh, Marsha Fudge is, as you can see, in this headline, she's um, she cares a lot about food security and, and hunger, and from what we can tell, she's not she's not quite in the pocket of big ag in the way that Heidi Heitkamp is. Heidi Heitkamp, um, the problem with the framing of this story is that they they talk about it as like an urban versus rural issue, but in fact, a lot of folks in rural areas don't want to see the level of control from a few large agribusinesses that we see now. So, um, so that's one of the big critiques of Heidi Heitkamp is that she, she will probably continue things more or less as they are. And that means a lot of, of money going to the really big farms, um, not a lot of, of connection drawn between the way that money is spent and the way the farming actually is happening. So 
there's one really good example of kind of the way digging into policy, I think, can help. I, I realize that we can't choose <laughs> the USDA secretary as individuals, but I do think that that paying attention to this stuff and, you know, starting to really understand what it means is a big part of changing it. And the more of us who understand it, the better. So Twilight, two things. The USDA handles food stamps too, right? Yes. That's part of the farm bill. Yes. And I would mm -hmm. would talking to Barbara Lee's office, would our contacting Barbara Lee's office um, for Martha Fudge would that do anything? Is there any? Um, it's a good question. It could. I mean, as far as I know, there are these people involved in the transition process, and I don't know how much, you know, our current members of Congress can impact the transition process. Right. Okay. There's like a whole, you can read up on the transition, the members of the Food and Ag Transition Committee. I, I, um, I believe that's public. We've seen it. And okay. it's, uh, it's a lot of smart folks from what I can tell. Some of them I know, um, but they, I think they're the ones who are gonna be doing what they can to advocate for oh. whoever they think is best. Okay, well then maybe they might be the people to contact, so. Possibly. <laughs> if, you know, if you know who to contact. Um, next question. Um, this one's from Linda and she wanted to know when we shut down in the pandemic, in March, April, May, there were a lot of things from toilet paper to green sauce to some mustards that became unavailable. Can you talk about why that happened? Another, make, yes, another please. huge <laughs> topic. Um, the, the toilet paper one I can talk about. I'm not sure about the specific food items she's talking about, but I can, I can guess. Um, I think the biggest shift as probably a lot of you know, was from um, food service and restaurants to and other places where say toilet paper was used offices to having to have that all channeled into the retail sector. So that caused that that's really what caused the bulk of that huge uh, transition and the resulting panic was the fact that, you know, we had had 20% going to offices and 10% going to hotels and universities. And, you know, we had had, for the most part, when it comes to food, I won't really talk about toilet paper, but when it comes to food, we, we've talked with a lot of businesses who struggled to make that pivot from selling to restaurants and institutions. And there's so many institutions, really. School, the school needs changed and um, there, yeah, so many other types of institutions that were buying food and institutional buying of food has been a, an area where a lot of uh, advocates have been trying to make changes, but, um, you know, just losing all those institutions at once was a big deal and having so much food have to suddenly go to retail stores was, you know, it took a really long time. The, the one thing that we found though, was that smaller producers, so definitely in the case of meat producers, but some others too, that they were often in a better position to make that pivot because they weren't so bound up in this in the system. Um, and so we, as a lot of you may have done, you know, lots of people signed up for CSAs and lots of people started thinking about getting stuff locally because it felt like a more direct and in some cases easier and more accessible way to, to get food. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. One more and then maybe I'll let you have, do some more remarks and then we'll do the rest of them at the end. Sure. Um, would more small organic farms help to repopulate the small towns in the Midwest? I mean, I know that a lot of the small towns in the Midwest are just have been emptied of their people and they're all coming yeah. to California where we just can't accommodate. I mean, <laughs> we don't have the housing. Well, they were before the fires. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know that that might be the, the turning point for a lot of people. But would smaller organic farms generally take a lot more labor? Yes. So, so this this is a question that I think a lot about, um, you know, and then there's the theory and there's the practice, right? Absolutely. In theory, that's that's something that could make a big difference. 
um, it's very hard to walk back efficiency though. Very, very hard. That's another big lesson that I've learned covering food for so long. Um, and you know, it's hard for all of us to walk back efficiency, right? When once we started using smartphones and we could communicate with someone with a text, it became a lot less common for us to pick up the phone and talk to them. And I think that um, because of how efficient the food system has become, and granted there are lots of problems with it and those are really coming clear right now, but that's, that's the big piece of it that I struggle with. Um, is that uh, smaller independent farms are generally less efficient. So there's that, but um, I, have, I have been asking that question and trying to figure out like, what are the pockets, what are the areas where people really are succeeding at getting more kind of ecologically focused, more um, justice focused farming, like really getting it happening. Um, and there are some places and there are some efforts and they're exciting. And that's actually one of the things that we spend a lot of time on civil eats is tr doing is trying to find those little pockets or, or what I like to think of it as like little wedges in this really big system. Um, one example, I went to Nebraska two and a half, oh, three years ago. I can't remember if it was two or three years ago, but I went to Nebraska when they were building this big Costco plant. They are producing chicken in Costco and they built what was basically the largest chicken processing plant in that whole area. And Nebraska had never had chicken processing. So they came in and said, hey guys, like you can sign up with us and produce a huge number of chickens and we'll process them. And this is a new business model for farmers here. And so I went there right at that time and there were some other people fighting the Costco plant and they decided that the most effective way to do that was to, to try to get farmers on board with something else, to try to find something else that could be profitable for them, because that's the real tricky thing, right? Um, so they have been starting a, like a network of regenerative, and they're not certified organic, but they are trying to do things differently. They're trying to do a pasture-based poultry program there. And it's been slow going, but they're building it, which is exciting. Um, and yeah, I think that point about bringing back people is really key, right? Because mm -hmm. we know that in all over the Midwest, in a number of states that I've visited and read about, that the the communities that actually have a thriving young population, the only ones really are the ones, I mean, aside from there are of course urban areas in the Midwest, but the rural ones, the only ones are the ones where people have come in to do meat processing. And so there's, wow. there's communities of recent, you know, newcomers to mm -hmm. this country who are having children and filling the schools and <sighs> participating in civic life. And, they have actually brought back a lot of life to these communities. Um, they've been really impacted by coronavirus, which is a whole other story, but um, right. that's been, you know, an unfortunate thing that that's, that it, it has to be um, connected to these really, really uh, draconian <laughs> systems of, of, you know, processing meat. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic that that's possible. And I spend almost every day of my life trying to think and trying to focus on ways that whether it's a policy level or a lever or an actual like on the ground lever, I'm constantly right. trying to think about how that's possible because yeah, the, the communities and I mean, there was a great story today, actually political, Politico, I could bring it up if people are curious. Politico had a really good story today about um, the alienation in rural areas that a lot of folks feel, what farmers and otherwise, because they're, they've just they've lost trust in the Democrats, and building that trust is going to be a slow process. And unless unless there's a real focus on reforming agribusiness, that may not happen. Yeah, it, it's a big and scary topic but it sounds it sounds like the u.s is the same as any other country is that people move to where the jobs are and yeah, if there's no income source mm -hmm. in the midwest anymore uh if you either have to get big or get out mm -hmm. 
then of course people moved away. So, yeah, sorry, I'm just opening a window here because it's hot. Um, I think that's the case. I think there are, although in a lot of parts of the world, though, there's still like a, a culture of smallholder farms, um, right. people who are feeding themselves on their own land in a way that, um, but it is mostly the developing world where that's happening or is still right. happening, I should say. When there's there, and there are places where there are these like really inspiring peasant movements and people who are, sorry, my computer's shaking, people who are really proud to be smallholder farmers. Right. Okay, I'm gonna vanish again. I'm gonna let you make some more remarks. And if people wanna put questions in the chat box, um, I will come back in a little bit and ask more questions. Sounds good. All right, I could see where I was. I was talking about the consumer side um, of the food and ag world. Let's see. Um, I know you guys have talked a fair amount about food waste. Um, and I think that's a big, big piece of the puzzle. Um, I don't know, should I talk about labels? I can. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, there was a question about organic and we write a lot about organic and the organic certification process and the organic standards. And um, I get one question I get a lot is whether organic is still a meaningful label. And I usually come down on yes, for the most part it is. It's not, it's not perfect. Um, we cover it all the time. Um, I wanted to bring up one story about dairies because this is one example that I think is kind of a good one. It's a little bit technical, but there's, um, there's a lot of focus on the dairy industry and the way that we've just hemorrhaged small dairies in this country over the last 10 years. I mean, the numbers are really astounding, particularly in states like Wisconsin and Minnesota. And so there's, you know, there's talk about can organic save that industry. Um, for the most part, you know, some people point to the rise of milk alternatives as the reason that dairies, that small dairies are suffering. And I don't actually think that that's true. I think that um, it's, it is true that, that dairy alternatives have risen a bit, you know, they're, they're way more popular than they were when I was a kid, for instance. But I actually think that there is, um, there's room in the, in the retail space for both. And that um, the larger problem is these really gigantic dairies that have shown up in places like Texas and the, the Central Valley here in California and Oregon. And I mean, just like mega, mega dairies. Um, and some of those are certified organic, <laughs> not a lot, but some of them are. And the, one of the ways that they have been able to uh, do that as certified organic dairies is they take advantage of a loophole that allows them to acquire cows um, partway through the process. Whereas a lot of the small dairy farmers can't just go out and buy the cows, milk them and move on. Um, you know, small dairies in this in places like Wisconsin and Minnesota, they raise usually fewer than 50 cows. They're, they're actually really small and they sell into cooperatives and those cooperatives are tricky. They're not always the best, but they've been doing it for a long time. Um, so this is just one example of the fact that there are loopholes. There are quite a few loopholes in organic. Uh, you guys have, you may have followed some of the stuff around poultry there you can have organic poultry and give them access to the back to the outdoors and a lot of the time that means a little porch like a place where they can wander out for a few minutes if they want um, but it by no means means that they're what i think a lot of people would think of as free range or on pasture um, there was a big effort to try to change that to try to bring about a new set of standards for organic animal or I should say livestock production around the end of the Obama administration and it was killed right at the beginning of the, the Trump administration. So um, so there's there have been efforts to make organic more kind of stringent and more 
meaningful in the sense of, of what people expect from it and the original standards, which were written 20 years ago. Um, but it's, it's a real mixed bag. I'll say that. I do think that it's, uh, there's still a lot of value in organic and there still are a lot of people who, um, who toil for, for many hours to make, sh to try to make sure that the standards are real. Um, I won't go too far into to that. If someone's curious, so I'd be happy to tell you more. Um, what else? Oh, I also get asked a lot about meat and its role in environmentally sustainable food production. And I know that everyone has their sort of their own feelings about the animal welfare side of things, whether meat has a role in their diet or not. But in terms of the sustainability piece, um, I could tell you what I think, <laughs> which is, um, we need to eat less of it and we need to eat it from better places if we're eating it. We need to eat it from folks who are using, utilizing pasture. Um, and I think the two actually dovetail really nicely because when producers are, are using pasture, particularly for uh, the animals that, that really need pasture, like cows, um, the, the production cost is just much higher. They need to, it, it takes a lot longer to raise the animals. Um, it requires more from the, the farmer to raise those animals. And so there's no way that we would be able to afford the quantity of meat that the average American eats if we ate, if we all ate that kind of meat. I mean, Jeff Bezos probably can, but most of us unlikely. So um, that's, that's kind of my personal take on it. And, I, and again, it's very subjective. Um, I do think that beef, we know that beef, um, and other ruminant animals like lamb, you know, sheep and goats that, you know, we know that they're the, that they're the big culprits when it comes to, to climate and greenhouse gas emissions in particular. Um, they burp methane. And so even if folks moved towards chicken and pork and away from those animals and considered those animals a little more of a treat, that could make a big difference um, because beef, it turns out that beef production is a really huge part of the um, the, f the climate footprint of all agriculture, and there are there are little ways that people are trying to figure out how to change that. Like we did a story a while back. Sorry, I'm not um, I don't have all these stories up, but I could bring it up if people are curious. We did a story about seaweed, and there's a red seaweed that. Um, is being fed to cows on an experimental level because it reduces methane. And if that were to scale up on any kind of real level, it could have some impact. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, my take on meat. I, I realize it's only my take. Um, I could say more about re this move towards regenerative agriculture if folks are curious. And there's there's, as you might imagine, there's actually a little bit of tension between regenerative agriculture folks and organic folks. Like that's a real interesting moment. Um, could talk about that. Um, I have two questions, Twilight, about, sure, regenerative, yes. about regenerative agriculture since mm -hmm. you brought it up. Great. Um, Beatrice asked, what is the difference between organic agriculture and re regenerative agriculture? And then Jill asked, um, how will big ag intersect with the increased focus on regenerative agriculture is big ag paying attention. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. In fact, so could, could you maybe, could that. you maybe talk about regenerative agriculture? Just give us two sentences, mm -hmm. what it is. Yes. Although this is uh, the problem. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> All right. as best so when can. it comes to organic, we have, a federally recognized set of standards. And not everybody follows those standards in the same way. And there's there's the, I would say there's like the spirit of the law and the letter of the law and a lot of farms do things differently. But there is, there are some baseline definitions of organic, like particularly that, that it doesn't involve synthetic fertilizer, synthetic pesticides. Like those are the two really big ones, but there, there are a lot of other things involved, but those are the ones that a lot of people really care about. Um, regenerative, regenerative, on the other hand, although the term has been around for a long time, um, it's really gotten hot this last year, 
two years maybe. Um, and I see it used, I could just tell you like the different populations that are using it in different ways. And this will, this will help you understand why it's not cut and dry at all. So um, there are farmers in the Midwest who are using practices like no-till, just literally tilling their land less or cutting out all tilling of their land. Um, and cover crops and other things that improve the soil and and legitimately, I think, really do make for a more ecological system for growing big commodity crops. Um, but they often still involve herbicide. They usually, once their soil improves, they have less of a need for herbicide and pesticide, which is great, but it's not about cutting out those chemicals. So. Those folks use the term regenerative. And then um, we have a group of people who really strongly believe that regenerative should be an extension of, an or of organic. It should fill in the gaps. I was talking a little bit about how organic has not, um, hasn't always lived up to consumers' expectations. And it's true that when it comes to soil, we actually have a story coming out about exactly this in the next week. So I recommend coming back if you want to dig in. But um, you know we have we have organic farms that focus really intensely on building soil and are effectively regenerating the soil and sequestering carbon and so a lot of it has to do with carbon. But then we also have regenerate we have organic farms like say down in the Central Valley that are growing two thousand acres of baby lettuces and they're using the right fertilizers and uh, they're using, you know, some less toxic, less synthetic pesticides, but they're not, they don't really care about the soil in particular. Um, and so there are folks who say that that's, that doesn't go far enough, that organic should also definitely be regenerative, meaning it should, the soil should be cared for in a way that um, is good for water quality, is good for uh, carbon sequestration, um, other things than, than what the baseline organic covers. And so there's a group of people who've decided they want to create a regenerative organic label. And they think all regenerative agriculture should be layered on top of organic certification. And they have something called the regenerative organic label. And it's, um, it's very new and it's just kind of come into being. So this is the challenge there. <laughs> it's the wild west. There are a lot of people calling what they do regenerative with, you know, the key goal usually being about the climate and about climate, about carbon going into the soil. And I could go more deeply into to what that means and, and how that works if people are interested. I think people probably would be interested. I, th I think originally when, when, a small group of farmers became organic farmers, or I'm sorry, returned to being organic farmers, that the soil and soil building and regenerative were pretty much part of their definition. Yes. And yes. probably they were part of, you know, a pretty primary part of the CCOF, mm -hmm. California Certified Organic Farms For program. Sure. But then when we got the federal ag standard which i and hundreds of thousands of others wrote letters on um because they were going to allow sewage sludge and all sorts of other things to be part of organic and then we sort of got into quote unquote industrial organic and i think those are the people you're talking about mm -hmm. who don't particularly they they want the organic cer certification the name the price for their products but they do not per se care about the the soil as much as as the original pioneers. Right, and there's there's a reason, for, I mean, what, there are a lot of reasons for that, right? I mean, one of them being the profit motive, but one of the other big reasons is, and I've talked to a number of big companies about this, they, um, they heard from consumers that what they cared about was pesticide residue, mm. that they wanted to protect themselves from pesticides. They wanted to protect their right. family. They, they saw organic as a healthier option. So most people for a long time were not buying organic because of the environmental impact, or at least when, when they were surveyed, that's not what they said. Right. 
And so that became kind of the marketing point. I mean, I went to, I will not name them, but I went to a large berry grower last summer and talked to them about some farming that they're doing, not using the soil. They're doing what is essentially, I mean, it's kind of being called hydroponics, but they grow in substrate. Mm -hmm. And there's a move in the berry, berry world towards that, or that's one potential way that people are talking about growing strawberries is waist height in substrate. And so it doesn't okay. involve the soil at all. And I asked them, I was like, you know, you're not using soil. Some farmers have a real issue with this. There's, there's a lot of tension right now about whether hydroponics should have been included in organic. And it turned out that, um, uh, the committee that decides on the standards said, yes, hydroponics can be organic. And so I asked like, well, you're kind of just ignoring the soil. Like, what do you think about that? And they said to me directly, well, that's not what our consumers care about. The people who buy our berries, they buy the organic ones because they don't want their kids exposed to the pesticides. Right. So I, I think from a farm worker standpoint, something grown at waist height could also be beneficial. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there's that. Um, you know, not bending over. Sure. That that's really hard and damaging work to farmer workers. Mm -hmm. So yes, although that, that's a big reason why they're they're talking about moving in that direction. The mm -hmm. companies that can't afford it, not all the companies can. But that's a little bit of right. a tangent. One thing I wanted to show you was this. Um, so, so it's not black and white, basically. <laughs> none, of, none of this is black none and of this white. Is black and white you know i i guess i would say sadly because i think a lot of the folks who um initially kind of get engaged with talking about food and where it comes from like they understandably they want to be able to go to the store and say like quickly you know these are my choices and mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's that simple unfortunately but i no. did want to share this one story um one of the questions was about big ag and regenerative and whether they're kind of getting in on the act. And, and the answer is absolutely because um, for a lot of reasons, I mean, one of them being that most of them have directors of sustainability. Most of them are thinking about climate and what they can do to make sure their food chain is more resilient. So that's like, that's a legitimate reason that, that, companies like General Mills, this this story is about General Mills, um, an effort on their part. Um, but there's a lot of other companies that are spending money in a way where they're essentially trying to support regenerative production. Um, what that means, again, is, is variable. But um, Yes, the answer is absolutely. Big Ag is all over regenerative because in a lot of cases it's cheaper than organic too. Right, right. And they see, they see it as more bang for the buck. Can I segue slightly? Yes, please do. This is sort of the, this is sort of the same question, but about seeds. There's a lot of us, you know, at Alameda Backyard Growers, we have a, uh, our new free seed library and we have since July given out more than 2,300 packets of seeds to people. And Great. so Linda has a question and she says, if we buy seeds from Johnny's or Territorial, are these in fact, are these seeds in fact from the big four chemical companies or are they still independent? Um, I don't know about Johnny's. I think Territorial is independent. I, I don't know. You know, I don't have a list right. of, I, I wish I did. Right. But I think you can find out pretty easily. Yeah, I think Johnny's would let you know. And in, in fact, they breed a lot of their own stuff. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the smaller companies, Native Seed Search specializes in uh, Native American seeds and they grow out all their own seeds. Mm -hmm. You can check on some of the smaller companies and there are a lot of smaller companies coming online I'll see if I can put together a list of them. And a lot of them have small farms that are growing for them, that are actually growing out their seeds for them. So I'll put a list online. Most of them will tell you um, in their information where they're getting their seeds. Johnny's I know breeds a bunch of, of their own seeds. So I, I do believe that they separated when Monsanto bought um, a lot of seed companies up 
they sort of separated and f refused to carry any Monsanto seeds. So. Yeah, my, my sense is that a lot of the seed companies that do sell to independent gardeners are more likely to be independent. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not all of them, though. Right. No. I mean, Gurney's, Gurney's, and there's another one I can't think of. I'm pretty sure that they are carrying seeds from the um, from the big four chemical companies. So. Sounds like you know more about it than I do. Well, between the two of us, we walk through it. Um, I'm a lazy gardener. I usually buy starts or, or I save my own seed. <laughs> So Jillian had made a comment about um, getting back to the cattle mm -hmm. and she, she commented about pasture farming as discussed also stores carbon in the soil. And then my question to tack well, on to that. We think it does. I'll just say that we don't know for sure. I mean, right. okay. th there's, there's a lot of optimism about that right now and there's a lot of talk about how it's possible that the right kind of grazing can sequester enough carbon to offset the cow's burps um but we right. don't actually have a ton of science to back that up sadly okay. there is um there was a study done on a, a big farm in georgia will harris's ranch and it was done in conjunction with General Mills, actually. Um, that's the biggest study that's been done. And sadly, they didn't get it peer reviewed. We went to go and Ouch. try to write about it and they promoted it. I think this is one of the big challenges with um, big ag and regenerative right now. They promoted it, they sent out press releases about it and they hadn't had it peer reviewed. And so now I don't think they're gonna get to have it peer reviewed. And there are other, there are other folks working furiously to try to prove this. Mm -hmm. um, Tomcat Ranch down in Pescadero, I know they, they're doing a lot of their own independent science to try to prove that their grazing they're doing sequesters carbon and they haven't had much luck with it yet. And they say they think it's largely because of the really dry conditions they've had the last couple of years. Right, right. So we're talking about cattle burping methane, but we used to have an entire continent covered in buffalo. Mm -hmm. Do they not burp methane in the same way? Do we know? Well, okay, so that's that's absolutely true, and it's a really good point. And that gets to a point that I should probably have made when I started to talk about, you know, climate and agriculture, because even though agriculture is an important part of the climate puzzle, and there was actually a big study that came out. Um, here, I can, I can navigate to it. Um, well, actually, this is probably faster. Um, big study that came out, you all may have seen. Um, and it basically showed that even if, let's see, I wanna make sure I get this right. Um, Basically, even if we meet our Paris Agreement goals otherwise, if we don't include climate, it's not going to work. I mean, sorry, if we don't include agriculture, it's not going to work. So agriculture is a really important piece of the puzzle, but it's not it. It's not all of it by any means. So we were not taking fossil fuels out of the ground and burning them when we had those right. um, Okay. other animals all over the... <laughs> Right. I mean, all over the continent. Uh, the folks at the Marine Carbon Project, I was at an event they hosted last year, and they did a really beautiful job of laying out the way that carbon, you know, naturally carbon exists in the atmosphere, the ocean, uh, like the deep mineral layer of the soil, and the top layer of the soil, and that it makes sense that, that there would be carbon in all of those places and that it always has been in all of those places. But what we've done is we've moved it. We've essentially taken it out of the soil, put a lot of it in the ocean and a lot of it in the, the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a tangent, but animals are, are only ultimately a small piece of the puzzle. And you, we could all eat vegetarian or we, you know, we could, we could discover that 
you know, managed grazing, the best kinds of grazing practices sequester a lot of carbon and it, it wouldn't be enough if we continue to burn fossil fuels. Okay. Hey, what about that drought? Uh, you know, we're all talking about the pandemic, but it's December. It hasn't rained yet. We got a third of our rain last season that we usually get. A little scary. Mm -hmm. um, are, farmer, are farmers concerned? I mean, we're, we're not seeing anything about, you know, about that in the midst of the pandemic and the election and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm sure farmers are concerned. Yeah, it's, and the fact that we have fires Going, happening in Southern California in December is a really big deal too. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had the the uh, honor to get to interview Tom Philpot about his new book, and I highly recommend it. Let's see if I can find it. Um, he talks. So he's got a great book out. Um, here it's in this this rundown we kind of gathered all the books that we'd been sent and the ones that seemed worth mentioning we decided to share we do that every year um but so i interviewed tom philpot and he wrote a book about basically about agriculture and the big picture of it but he focused on two areas he focused on water in california and soil in iowa and those are two areas where things are reaching kind of a crisis level. So I highly recommend, gosh, we, we really focused on a lot of books. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get down to it. <laughs> where is it? Perilous Bounty is what it's called. Um, but he talks a great deal in this book, The Looming Collapse. It's a very dramatic <laughs> title. Um, but he does really feel like we're on the edge of a collapse and that the groundwater situation here in California, in addition to the snowpacks and the dwindling nature of the snowpacks um, is getting really severe and could cause, if we don't turn things around very soon, could cause a collapse of our food system. Um, I don't know if any of you all are following the, the groundwater situation here, but there's, or I should say in California, I'm not in California, but in California, um, the, there's a, a rule that's going into place um, in the next, I think it's, it actually started for some operations already, but it's going to be going into place over the next few years and people have to use less groundwater and it's going to be really controversial. Um, yeah. I find it really interesting that we're bringing more people in and we're building more housing um, mm -hmm. at the same time as we're having a real water crisis. So, yeah, it doesn't bode well. No, no. Thank you for addressing that. And I will be getting this book and I'm sure getting a little depressed over it, but. Yeah, you might need a book group to discuss it with. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's a great book. And Tom is a friend of mine and he's spent the last 15 years writing about food and agriculture. So in a way, this is kind of, it, this sums up what he's learned in that time. Right, right. And it's not all dark. There is there is hope, like I was saying earlier, there are pockets, there are people who are really pushing to try to, um, to try to turn the ship around and to try right. to bring about better practices and better policy. And, um, and I, I should say, I haven't said this yet, but I think there's also a real, I think, coupled with a lot of the conversations around Black Lives Matter and social justice issues in this country, there's been a really, I think, inspiring and um, important awakening around land equity and who deserves to farm and who deserves to have land. And, um, and I do think that is filtering into some policy discussions. And I know some people on the transition team who want to see more help for farmers of color and you know, a different, a different approach to equity around land. So that's really exciting. That's one of the, I think the, the bright points. Um, are, are there any landscape. projects where we could help um, in terms of transition? Because I know there are a lot of young farmers, mm -hmm. i.e. 
younger than average age 59, mm -hmm. yeah. young families who want to come into farming, but they're having yeah. difficulty with land. And I know there are conservation easements. Are there other projects that are Do you are know about California on? Farm Link? I do. They're one of, they're one of the hundred emails I get every week. I mean, I think California Farm Link is really impressive. Um, mm -hmm. They're really doing a lot of great work to try to get young and beginning farmers on the land because not all not all beginning farmers are young either which is an interesting thing there are a number right. of people who who have other careers like veterans there's a whole movement of of veterans who are going back to the land um mm -hmm. i think california farm lake is is really worth following and supporting um who else there there are quite a few i mean there's the national young farmer coalition and they're interesting because they really try to work uh, with all young farmers. So they're not going to just be talking about sustainable producers, but they they can tell you that most young people going into farming are doing it because they want to see a more sustainable approach taken. Right. Okay. So these would be places to get involved. Yeah. Maybe I see think if we national, can make a difference. Yeah. The National okay. Young Farmer Coalition, they are, they're actually, you know, in Washington a lot of the time trying to move the needle. Um, NSAC, the uh, National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, um, they bring together a bunch of different groups, including the um, National Young Farmers Group. Um, NSAC is really great to follow. And especially if you want to get wonky on <laughs> the Farm Bill or the Agriculture Committee, NSAC breaks it down really well. We talk to them for I don't know, 10 or 20% of our articles, we call them up whether we're quoting them or we just want to get their take on things because they're, right. they're in DC and they, they have their kind of ear to the ground. I'd okay. also really recommend, um, if you want to get wonky, I'd recommend reading um, Politico has great agriculture coverage and they don't, unlike Civil Eats, they, I'm sure that the, a lot of the writers have, um, an agenda when it comes to what they want to see agriculture <laughs> become, but they, because they're political, they have to cover all the big ag folks and they do it really well. Um, and they have a morning newsletter you can get called morning ag. <laughs> if you want to be really wonky. I know <laughs> it's, it's good stuff no. though. You can learn a lot no. about what's happening. Um, and you can, what I really like it for is you can learn about the industry groups and what they're, what uh, levers they're yeah. mm -hmm. trying to change. Okay. Yeah. Because I know, I know I, refinery, Corn Refiners Association and the, um, you know, the pork board and because the, their money ultimately and the way that they're spending energy and time that is really shaping our food system. And it's often in a very invisible way, mm -hmm. but the walls that they put up to prevent change are in some ways more impactful than anything the little guys are trying to do. Okay. So Politico, that's, that's the one that I'm not, not actually on because I do actually get the, the weekly emails from all of the other organizations and I highly recommend them to people. So if you want to become more involved and actually, actually, make some change so did you have other things you wanted to talk about or you i know we're we're past the hour here yeah what um, time what time is it i can't see on my screen it's six a little bit a little eight, bit 11. after eight eight mm -hmm. eleven yeah okay um i mean we could talk more about covid if it interests folks i i didn't i know i talked a little bit about it um we could talk more about it in terms of food access and hunger because that's a huge issue right now and i feel a little bad for skipping over it but we've covered it a lot on our site lately mm -hmm. um i don't know if that interests people we've also we've been trying to make draw the connection between food and diet and covid which is like you know a tricky thing to talk about and um definitely very complicated but when we when we get into talking about you know who has access to healthy food like the fact that I can eat vegetables and whole grains and that I I that that will probably hopefully prevent me from having a um you know one of the the important sort of 
other illnesses that impact people's vulnerability to COVID, like that's, that's a huge factor and it's a huge privilege. And um, mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time trying to cover that and trying to draw that connection between f access to healthy food and people staying healthy in general. And it's really horrible that we're seeing that writ large right now. Right. I've got one more question here for you and um, that's from Katie and she wants to know if there are any podcasts that you would recommend. Um, that's a great question. Um, well, Tom Philpot, who is on your screen right now, um, he has a podcast called the bite podcast um, through mother Jones. That is good. What's it called the bite bite. Okay. I think it's just called bite. Um, there may be another word in there, but it's easy to find on the Mother Jones site. And then um, uh, we've we've worked with a, a great guy named Stephen Satterfield who has a podcast called Point of Origin. And that's a little more like anthropological, but he's been getting more political lately. Um, uh, what else? He's actually going to be doing more podcasting. Um, there's the gastronome ladies um no sorry gastropod is what it's called two women and it's a little more foodie there's a lot of foodie ones <laughs> there aren't as many uh food and ag ones um between all 50 of you and i <laughs> we are considering doing a podcast with civil Eats, but it hasn't happened yet maybe one day soon in your spare time all right, any other questions? I don't see anything else. Thank you so much for being here. Al Allison, did you wanna wrap up? Yes, you gotta un things and, and we were gonna open up the video because Twilight wanted to see what people look like. So Twilight, can you close your screen? Yes, and we'll I can. Yes, I can stop here. sharing. And I wanted to obviously thank you so much for this amazing talk, so much information. Uh, I hope I didn't I knew, overload you guys. <laughs> perhaps, but I was thinking we should definitely um, make, get a list from you of, of these resources that you mentioned. We can post that on our website in addition we to We also the have, we have a list on Civil Eats. We have a resources page. Can you remind people again how they can uh, subscribe to Civil Eats? And then I'm going to have Ron say a few words at the end. Sure. Um, so it's easy to subscribe to Civil Eats. You just go to civileats.com and if you start to try to read, you'll get a paywall and the paywall will say subscribe to read our content. And there's a, a $35, uh, you know, regular subscription rate, but right now we're, we're offering it pay what you can. So if you scroll down, you'll see that option. Not that we don't love getting you know, full price subscriptions when we can. But but like I said in the beginning, I, I really like just reaching more people. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we'd love for them to have a, a boost in, in readership based on the fact that people enjoyed your talk tonight. That would be great. So hopefully that'll happen. And Ron, I would, I'd would i like my husband Ron to say a few words. He's the president of our board. And thank you again, for taking some time from where you are in Hawaii tonight to give us this presentation. We're very grateful. Of course. So, um, thank you all. So good to see so many friends showing up on a Thursday night in the midst of the pandemic. Um, I recognize a lot of names. A lot of you were part of our Giving Tuesday, and I certainly, we all appreciate that. We're a very small shop, but we keep a very tight budget. Um, we are, of course, still accepting donations. That's always exciting to think about. Um, and a lot of this money goes toward the maintenance of these monthly educational meetings where the kind of information you got tonight um, is particularly important in this time and with all these changes we heard about and tonight's was particularly wide ranging. Um, so I wanna say thank you to Twilight. If I knew how to do the little clapping emoji, I would, I think <laughs> Zoom should have one. And I don't know if you can hear me clapping, but I am clapping. Thank you so much for your time, Twilight. Thank you, everybody, for coming and listening in tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. All right. Thank you. Join us again in the future, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Bye. All right. And we will e we'll try and email out the seed listing, too, for Thank everybody. Thank you for your
Okay. Thank you so much, Twilight. I'm gonna um, wave to you. Actually, you can't see me because my video is <laughs> on. But um, and then I'll turn off the um, the thing. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Good night. Stay healthy. Good night. Good night. Good night.